Remembered as a relic of the 80s, Tears for Fears history was rooted in trauma, something a lot of the band's young fans in the 80s identified with. But by the 90s, the band would hit some turbulent times, and today we're going to explore whatever happened to the group Tears for Fears. Tears for Fears leaders Roland Orzabal and Kurt Smith were both products of broken homes growing up in Bath, England. Smith would tell Vice, We both came from broken homes. We were both brought up solely by our mothers, more or less. Smith would have a brief career as a criminal serving time in juvenile detention that came to a head when he was arrested for stealing cameras from his school, while Orzabal would have exposure to show business early on in his childhood. Before his parents divorced, they would run an in-home promotion agency for working men's clubs. The entertainers who came through his childhood house included strippers, musicians, and ventriloquists. It was this exposure that gave Orzabal an introduction to the world of show business telling the Morning Call newspaper. It was an unorthodox house. Always a lot of entertaining people around, including these three absolutely great guitarists who used to come by. From watching them, I sort of fell in love with the guitar, he'd say. Orzabal's father was a World War II veteran who suffered from post-traumatic stress syndrome and had a chaotic relationship with Roland's mother, telling The Guardian, I had suffered from depression in my childhood. My dad had been in the Second World War, had electric shock treatment, suffered from anxiety, and was abusive to my mom. I kept a lid on my feelings at school, but when I was 18, I dropped out of everything and couldn't be bothered to get out of bed, he'd say. Orzabal would become a self-taught guitarist at the age of 9 and soon started playing in bands with his tastes including Paul Simon and The Talking Heads. For Orzabal, he would take a liking to glam acts including David Bowie and T-Rex, but unlike a lot of kids who discovered music at the local record store, he get his hands on songbooks and find bands on the program Top of the Pops. Smith and Orzabal would meet at the age of 13 after being introduced by a mutual friend. He would tell the Morning Call newspaper his first meeting with Smith, remembering, We went to call for Kurt, but his mother said he wasn't allowed out because he'd been in a fight. Instead, the boy stayed inside and played records, adding, We found we had a lot in common. We seemed to have the same sense of humor, and we both liked cute girls. What's more, we were the same height. He would admit that he was blown away by Smith's singing talents after witnessing him sing a Blue Oyster Cult album. The pair soon started playing together, first in heavy metal cover bands, before taking some time apart during which Smith attended college. It was during this break that Orzabal got involved in folk music and formed a band, but the pair's break would be temporary as they soon reconnected and played together as part of a mod group called Graduate, who landed a record deal. Both men were 18 at the time, and it was now 1980, and despite Graduate having a little taste of success in Spain with their single Elvis Should Play Ska, the band broke up the following year in 1981. Smith would tell Vice the turning point for both musicians, stating, What changed our view of music was Gary Newman. It wasn't even so much liking him, it's that we were kids following trends, and trends in those days were really powerful. It would also be Peter Gabriel's third self-titled album and Talking Heads Remain in Light that influenced both musicians. At 17 years of age, Orzabal would be introduced to the writing of psychologist Arthur Janov by guitar teacher after reading his book The Primal Scream. Janov would become most famous for pioneering something called scream therapy, which theorizes that neurotic behavior in one's adult years has its roots in repressed feelings and childhood trauma. Orzabal soon introduced Smith to the same form of therapy, telling Rolling Stone, I rushed out to everybody I knew and started blubbering to them about it. Everybody thought I was a nutter. The only person who could see any sense in it was Kurt. In fact, Tears for Fears would take their name from a chapter in Janov's Prisoner of Pain novel dealing with childhood nightmares. Tears for Fears would record a handful of demos with the help of Ian Stanley who allowed them to use his 24 track recorder and it was these demos that got them a record deal. The band's debut record 1983's The Hurting was very much colored by the pair's childhood experiences with Orzabal revealing, we believed we were victims and that very much colored our approach to The Hurting, thinking that we were born neutral beings and that our tough upbringing troubled us. The way of releasing the trauma of my childhood was to do primal therapy, which I did for six years. It was really gimmicky and very Californian, he'd say. The pair would end up meeting Janov in the mid-80s, but were disappointed by the author who had now gone Hollywood, according to the pair. The author would take the members of Tears for Fears to lunch and try to convince them to write a Broadway musical about primal therapy, but they declined. Getting back to The Hurting, the album was full of gloomy tracks including Watch Me Bleed and Suffer the Children. One of the biggest songs off their debut album would be Mad World, which Orzabal told The Guardian, I wrote it when I was 19 on the dole in Bath. 
We're known as a synthesizer group, but back then I just had an acoustic guitar. I've not told many people this, but I was listening to Radio 1 on this tiny radio and Duran Duran's Girls on Film came on. I just thought, I'm going to have a crack at something like this. I did and ended up with Mad World. It sounded pretty awful on guitar though. It was just me singing. Eventually we made the first demo of Mad World still with me singing, but I didn't like it. So I said to Kurt, look, you sing it and suddenly became fabulous, he'd say. The press would make a lot out of the primal scream therapy influences and lyrical content of the band's first record, something that irritated the band members with Smith looking back at the album years later, telling the LA Times in 1985, it's hard to look to now. It seems like what was on our minds so long ago. We made it when we were 20 and it had a lot to do with our emotions between 10 and 15. Recording it wasn't fun. It was hard to listen to just after we did it. It was hard dealing with those feelings. Maybe we were just taking ourselves a bit too seriously that adding, the press made too much about this. It's been written about so often that people should be bored with it. I know I am, he'd say. While the group's debut album wasn't a huge hit in America, it still sold a million copies worldwide. The success of the band's first record did little to impact the lifestyles of Smith and Orzabal. They both would stay close to their hometown of Bath and didn't have a ton of celebrity friends or live a promiscuous life marrying their high school sweethearts. As the duo began working on their follow-up record, they were caught between what the record company wanted and where they wanted to go artistically. Orzabal will tell Las Vegas Weekly, I suppose our whole thrust musically and philosophically as Tears for Fears came out in the hurting. When we finished the album, it was almost like, okay, well, we've kind of set our bet. What are we going to do now? But of course, we were successful and the record company was pushing us to come up with another single. Bowing to record label pressure to strike when the iron's hot, the band would return to the studio to work on new material, which resulted in the standalone single, The Way You Are. The single would peak at number 24 and it would prove to be a commercial disappointment following the momentum they'd achieved from their debut album, though the band members themselves felt angry that they'd compromised themselves artistically to fulfill a commercial obligation. Smith would tell Consequence of Sound, The Way You Are was the least favorite song of either of ours. Definitely one of the worst recordings we've done. We're basically coerced by the record company to go in and do something to release quickly after the hurting was successful, and that's what we came up with. The a &R guy behind us at the time thought it was the best thing we'd ever done. It was just so fragmented to me and so not a song. It's just something created in the studio, he'd say. It would be the way you are that made the band realize they had to change their musical direction. With Smith telling the LA Times, we started an album at the end of 1983, but we didn't like it. It was too much like the first one, and we were determined to do something different. There was record company pressure after the first album. It was successful worldwide and they wanted us to do another album, no matter what the quality, just as long as we did it quickly. But we weren't willing. While the album connected with listeners who could relate to the difficult upbringings of the duo, some critics labeled their debut record as pretentious. As a result of all the pressure, the band changed their approach with Smith pointing out in the same interview, we took a break from serious recording, a couple of months to experiment and play around with music, try things we'd never tried before. The result would be a more straightforward pop album in 1985 titled Songs from the Big Chair, with Smith adding to the LA Times. The material on the album is basically straight pop, the kind of stuff played on the radio all the time. The heavy focus of the band's dark and gloomy lyrics led the group to not include a lyric sheet for their sophomore effort, with Orzabal telling the morning call, we noticed people were reviewing the lyrics apart from the music, but you've got to lump it all together. People took what we put across on the first album to be all that there was to us. Such an expression of feelings may have been a bit heavy for people to accept, as some people got the impression that we didn't know how to smile. Adding about the group's second album, what I think we've done in this album is put across a more balanced picture of our personalities by combining emotion with humor, and the album's far more representative of us. Songs from the Big Chair shows more maturity, this is us because men. Based on the strength of several big singles including Shout, Head Over Heels and Everybody Wants to Rule the World, the album would go platinum five times in America. It was also around this time that the band drew frequent comparisons to Wham who came up at the same time, but the band shrugged off those comparisons. The media frequently summarized both groups audiences as young and female, but Smith would insist to the LA Times, there's a lot of older people at our shows too. We appeal to people who are serious about music, not just to young girls he'd say. When songs from the big chair took off in such a big way, Smith said he and Orzabal agreed to take a long rest, following the incessant touring and interviews that accompanied the project. After a much needed break, the duo began writing again in late 1986 before entering the studio the following year. But these sessions weren't fruitful with Smith telling the Sun Sentinel, we got together that year and started playing and realized after several months we really hated what we had done. 
the band would end up throwing away two years worth of work with Smith adding, we realized we wanted to produce the new album ourselves. We wanted a more accessible feel to the music. It was during this time the band would add a young pianist and vocalist Oletta Adams, who they met years back in Kansas City while on tour. The band would spend nearly another year and a half working on new music, resulting in the record Seeds of Love, which came out in late 1989. The album contained more politically themed song, a sign of the times as a divided country re-elected UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, giving her her third term. The four year gap between albums didn't seem to have much pressure from their label, Despite spending millions of pounds recording the album with Smith recalling to the Sun Sentinel, we were very lucky that Polygram didn't hang all over us. We knew we were running late, but not until 1988 did we feel any record company pressure, he'd say. Regarding the politically themed song, Smith would tell the same publication, we've never considered ourselves overtly political, but when it comes to English politics, people like Margaret Thatcher, you cannot just stand by and ignore all that's happening around us. We know we have a method of reaching people, but we've never wanted to preach. We like to make our views palatable, music that is easy to swallow, and I think we've done that, he'd say. While the album was a huge success, critically acclaimed and spurred several successful singles, the band wasn't without their detractors. The Sun Sentinel would write in 1990 during a profile on the band, and I quote, Because of the band's unique writing style and penchant for avoiding conventional bridge and chorus formations, many have dubbed them pompous, throwbacks to the mid-70s art rock era that featured groups such as the Moody Blues and Genesis. Critics would also accuse the band of boring a bit too heavily from the Beatles, and the recent single Sowing the Seeds of Love contains arrangements and several progressions that are similar to the Lennon-McCartney classic I Am the Walrus. Smith would answer back these accusations in the same paper saying, well, yes it was completely intentional, but I think we did it in such a way that people liked it. I read that Paul McCartney said on Italian television that we'd ripped him off. Well fair enough, we did, but no one should own a rhythm, no one owns any kind of music he'd say. Despite the success, Smith and Orzabal seemed to know that the end was near for the time being. In fact, at one point Orzabal was considering calling the album Famous Last Words, and the three year time frame that the band took to write their most recent album took its toll when Smith would go through a divorce at the same time and Orzabal's perfectionist attitude would stifle creative sessions. Smith would leave the band in the early 90s while Orzabal kept the band's name. It was in 1992 that the band's greatest hits album came out, and none of Smith's compositions made the record. The Hartford Current perfectly summarized the breakup and who the creative leader in the band was, saying, While he distinguished himself as a guy with the shorter hair, it was clear that Roland Orzabal was responsible for most of the band's creative direction. The Washington Post would echo the same sentiment in 1993, writing, Tears for Fears had one guy who seemed to do all the work and all the talking, while the other one apparently just showed up for the video shoots. The band's follow-up album, their first without Smith, Elemental, would be put out in 1993 and it would be their last album with Phonogram and Mercury Records. Orzabal would release another album under the Tears for Fears moniker in 1995 titled Raul and the Kings of Spain before the band underwent a period of inactivity. It wouldn't be until the early 2000s that the pair reconnected after dealing with some band-related business. Orzabal was still living in England while Smith had moved across the Atlantic and was now in America. They would reconvene and release their first album together in nearly a decade, 2004's Everybody Loves a Happy Ending. In the subsequent years, the band would tour extensively with other 80s era acts and celebrate the anniversary of their older albums, but not all of it was smooth sailing. Orzabal would be dealing with turbulent times reeling from the death of his longtime wife Caroline, who he'd been married to since 1982, who would pass away in 2017. She would deal with addiction and mental illness, leading him to his own addiction, going to counseling. Orzabal would tell MSN, Things started to look up. I did therapy, grief counseling, and a couple of rehabs, met a new woman, and my general demeanor and approach to life started to brighten up. He would end up writing new music with Smith, leading to the group's latest effort, 2022's Tipping Point, which would peak at number 8 on the US Billboard album charts. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again in Rock and Ultra Stories. Take care.